This is Speaking of Pets podcast, where we offer you up-to-date, science-based, accurate information. Aww. Oh, Gizmo! Good kitty. You're such a good kitty. And they're looking up <laughs> and howling in unison. If it affects pets, we'll, we'll talk, talk about it. Today's Speaking of Pets podcast is sponsored by Blue Buffalo, the maker of natural pet foods. Love them like family, feed them like family. Blue Buffalo offers wholesome, meat-first recipes with high-quality natural ingredients in flavors dogs and cats love. Discover formulas for all breed sizes, life stages, and lifestyles. And with Blue Buffalo's True Blue Promise, that assures that real meat is the first ingredient with no poultry byproducts, no corn, wheat, or soy, and no artificial flavors or preservatives. Hey everyone, welcome to Speaking of Pets. I'm Dr. Alice Novotny Jeroman, a board certified allergist and dermatologist, and I'm Janet Novotny King. I am not a board certified allergist and dermatologist. I'm the doctor's sister. I'm your average pet owner, lover, and rescuer. So welcome to the show today. And who do we have on today, Al? Well, before I reveal our guest, I have a question for you, Janet. Uh-oh. What would you do if you came home and you found your medication vial on the floor with nothing in it and Libby is sitting there, your golden retriever, mm-hmm. looking at you. What what would you do? Okay. Say, so I would say that, bad for <laughs> mine. And then I would freak out and call you because you're a veterinarian and I'm related. And you know All what right. I would tell you to do? You would tell I me would to tell do. you to call Pet Poison Helpline. And our guest today, Dr. Renee Schmidt, is the director and the Senior Veterinary Toxicologist at Pet Poison Helpline. Uh, She graduated from K-State, Kansas State, with her veterinary degree, and also is a diplomat of the American Board of Toxicology and the American Board of Veterinary Toxicology. And I can't wait to ask her all about Pet Poison Helpline because I can't tell you what a helpful, wonderful service that is. And we're not only talking about medications. We're talking about plants in the yard. We're talking about mushrooms. We're talking about minoxidil that people use to grow hair and you lay on your pillow and then the cat licks the pillow. I mean, we have a zillion questions for her because this is such a valuable service that we should all have on speed dial. They're open 24 seven. They have boarded specialists there, such as Dr. Schmidt. They have internal medicine. They have emergency room specialists. So welcome Dr. Renee Schmidt. We cannot, I, I, we might have to have you back for two segments because I'm telling you, we Janet and I both have a million questions. Lots so Janet, questions. why don't you start? Okay, well, I'm first gonna ask, okay. what is in my home that could be toxic to, I have two cats and a dog. I'm, I'm sure most people have those kind of domestic pets. So what is in my home that could be toxic to these pets? Yeah, so I think I'll first make a really general answer in that everything can be toxic, right? The dose, the dose makes the poison. That's kind of the saying in, in toxicology, which is the study of poison. And so the amount of what it is that an animal can get into can make it problematic or not problematic. But some of the most common household things that we're seeing would be maybe food products. So I don't know a, a good solid household that doesn't have chocolate in it. So um, I, I always have to survive with chocolate and xylitol, which is a sugar alcohol or a sugar substitute. And that's something that can be very problematic. And then we can think about how pulp cleaners, especially those things that have a powerful job to do. So the toilet bowl cleaner, the drain openers, the oven cleaners. Uh, then we can move along to our own medications and supplements. And it's always important to remember that just because it's a supplement doesn't mean that it's not potentially problematic. So our vitamins can be problematic and our prescription medications, over-the-counter pain medication, uh, kind of you name it. We could probably go through almost room by room and think about some of the, the most uh, problematic things, but those are probably the common ones. Then we could step outside. We can go out into our landscaping and think about starting plants, flowers that are out there. Or we can go to the garage and think about the antifreeze, maybe the gasoline or motor oil, those types of things that are out in that area. Or maybe go out to the shed and think about the rat and mouse bait that are out there. Uh, we can walk into the garden and think about the mole and gopher bait that's set out because they're they're wreaking havoc on your yard. 
And uh, just, again, just I think the list is almost endless, but that's a really good one of common things in the household. Wow. Well, I found out something really simple I didn't know. We, you know, we put peanut butter in the Kong, right? It's an entertainment thing. And some of those have xylitol in them. Yeah. So you have to look at the label and it's so common. Most people would probably just pick up a thing of peanut butter for their pet. And I just figured that one out. So I'm really, really careful about it. I yeah. Think. And that's a good comment to bring up. And so far, what I call the mainstream peanut butter brand. So, mm-hmm. you know, the big ones, you know, Jeff, Gibby, the store brand. So yeah. far, and we haven't found any that contain xylitol. And I really think about them more as the, I call them the boutique brand or mm-hmm. those brands that are the specialty brand. Yeah. Those are ones where you're kind of going into that more of that full food section or that kind of specialty food section. Those are ones where I would really be perking my ears and really paying attention to make sure I don't see down xylitol. And, but so far, um, cause I do the same thing. We have palms at home. My dog loves for me to slap some peanut butter in there. I stick it in the freezer and then it gives her a couple of hours of, of entertainment. So far, the mainstream brands are usually okay, but you're absolutely right. Check the back of that label before you give it anything to your pet. Check, yeah. check the label and make sure that it doesn't contain, specifically in dogs, xylitol. Um, cats, they get a free pass. They actually don't have an issue with xylitol, which is so uncommon for cats. Usually they're more sensitive to things than dogs. Wow. Talk to us about grapes and raisins, because I don't, they seem so innocuous. Um, and, isn't and it also apple, think... apple seeds too? Yeah, so Am we I can dive up two different ways. Yeah, so we'll start with grapes and raisins. And so with grapes and raisins, there, we don't know what the toxic component is yet. There's some theories and some thoughts out there, and we're probably getting closer to fight, figuring it out, but nothing that's been been able to be confirmed or said specifically this is what it is and so we can see kidney failure is what we can see with grapes and rape and we don't because we don't know what that toxic component or ingredient is we can't figure out how much can they eat safely and not eat safely Mm -hmm. i know when i was in practice that we had a client who that's how she gave her pet her medicine every day she shoved it into a grape and that's how they, they oh, got wow. their medicine and never had any issues. And we think there's probably some animals that are more sensitive than others. So some dogs that are more sensitive than other dogs, but grapes and raisins are a big concern for causing kidney failure. We oh. think about it in cats a little bit because we don't know for sure, yes or no. We've had some reports that grapes and raisins have caused kidney failure. It's like in the cats have developed kidney failure likely from the grapes and raisins. And so we treat them pretty much the same, but in dogs and cats, we for sure know that that's going to be an issue. And then when you mentioned apple seeds, so apple seeds have an ingredient in them that can cause cyanide poisoning. And that's also in our, what are, we call our pitted or stone fruits. So our peaches, our cherries, our nectarines, plums. Or we can actually see if they get into that seed and they do on it and they break over and they break open that seed and they get that toxic ingredient that's in there, then we can see cyanide. So that's where the blood isn't able to utilize, the body isn't able to utilize the, the oxygen that it needs because it can't come off of the blood and off of the blood. And I don't know if you just that recently saw in the news, there were some people in a country now I can't remember was it China or Japan I think some I, I now I can't remember the specific country but they <laughs> they died they had cyanide laced on their teacup and they were killed I think it was a murder suicide issue and they were died from cyanide poisoning but we can see that that being said these animals generally have to ingest quite a few seed they have to really be chewing at it they can't swallow the seed. If they swallow the seed, it stays in this nice little capsule and it doesn't get exposed to the body. But that's something that we definitely can see. Uh, one of the things we saw with this is with um, uh, nectarine, uh, um, nectarine and peach seed, apricot seed. You can purchase apricot seed um, from like a, a food section for your health. There have been some studies where they think that it may shrink cancer cells. 
And so you can take uh, a small amount of these. And there was a dog that actually ingested uh, a whole bag of uh, apricot seeds and developed cyanide poisoning. And we found that it's happening in humans as well. So it surprises me that there hasn't been some type of regulation from the FDA or or it's out of sense that the government has gotten involved and is still allowing these to be sold on the market, just like you would buy a bag of peanuts, you would buy apricot seeds. Wow. And you know, isn't that interesting? Because a lot of people think natural is mm -hmm. not harmful, but that's the perfect example of natural yeah. being harmful. Yeah. It is. And I, I often say to an extreme, I'll say, well, snake venom is also natural. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> but I don't want to be bitten by a snake. Speaking wow. of, we have two cats that are hunters. You know, they're outdoor cats. Three Alice this week in the yard. Three dead snakes. Ugh. I think they Ugh. found a nest. But we had a friend. I thought this was interesting. And it's a human thing. He would eat sushi every day for lunch. And he developed mercury poisoning. Mm. Yeah. And it's, it's a rash. And luckily, the doctor he went to had just suffered from it and recognized the symptoms. But I thought that, right? Because it's kind of an odd thing. Right. So I thought yeah. that was interesting. Yeah. So, yeah. Okay. So I'm a pet owner and the dog comes in and he, she's not acting right. And I'm like, God, she must've eaten something. I got to call. So I'd call the hotline. Then how do you narrow down what they ingested and then decide how to treat that? Yeah. So that's a great question. And we certainly do get calls from, from concerned pet owners where their pet just isn't acting normal. They want to rule out that they've gotten into something. And so we'll ask, a lot of questions. And so we'll ask questions about, you know, what do you have in your household? So we'll ask, you know, based on what signs they're having. So what symptoms they're showing, we can narrow things down to say, okay, well, this, this can cause this to happen. This can cause that to happen. And so we'll say, do you have, you know, did they have access to this? Did they have access to that? And we'll try to start narrowing things down a little bit. And sometimes we can narrow it down to say, uh, yes, this is most likely the culprit or, you know what, your pet just may actually be ill and, and, you know, be having some other signs at occurring. But a lot of times it's certainly more helpful if we know what it is they got into. My dog just got into ibuprofen or my dog just ingested some mushrooms in the yard and that helps us to narrow it down a little bit. But we can certainly buy based on what uh, the clinical signs your symptoms that your pet is showing and what you relay to us we can often narrow things down a little bit to say, yes, it could be related to something poisonous or probably is that related to something poisonous and guide you and, you know, what to do next, watch at home or take to a veterinarian. In the case of mushrooms, do you then have them get a mushroom from the yard and show you? I mean, how do you handle yeah. that? There's so many different kinds. Mushrooms are really challenging and mushrooms really require really a Get a specialist to be able to identify it. So they're called mycologists. So people who specialize in kind of fungus and and especially in the, the not just the identification of it, but even in like just what they are, where they live, you know, where they grow and those types of things. And so we do rely on outside sources to help with identification of mushrooms. We can help with, once it's been identified, this is what could happen to your pet. And this is, we can help that veterinarian then with the treatment recommendation. When I was in practice, I was in practice for 13 years before, before switching over to toxicology. And there were so many things that I just rarely ever saw. And so if I was presented with something that, like a mushroom, I wouldn't know even how to begin how to treat it. And so we utilize pet poison helpline when I was in practice as to how, what do I need to do with this particular one? See, that's what I think is so helpful because we as veterinarians have to know so much that there's, how can we know how to identify every mushroom and every plant? And, and that's why I think it's such a valuable service, not only for pet owners, but for veterinarians. Yes, for sure. And we, we really want to be in that partnership with pet owners to help them find what's going on, but then also for the veterinarians and the clinics to help them. So I guess maybe I'll step back just a little bit in the whole process. And you mentioned, you know, calling and how do we, how do you help me find that out? And so we narrow that down and we decide, do you need to go to a veterinarian or are there some things we can recommend at home? And in all honesty, there's not a lot of things we can do to treat pets at home. 
There's a lot of things that require prescription medication. Maybe they require intravenous fluid. Maybe they require certain testing. And so if there's things that we can do, we certainly will talk about it. But a lot of times, especially if they're really ill, they, they need to go in. Just as you may need to go into urgent care to your doctor's office. But once they, once they are there at the veterinarian, then that veterinarian can call us and we'll continue on with that case. Then we'll say, this is what we expect to see. This is when we expect to see it. This is how long it can last. Now, these are the treatments recommended step by step by step. These are the ways to treat it. And it's not something that we want to expect veterinarians to know how to treat every poisoning. There's thousands that are out there and there's things that are being you know, discovered or FDA approving new drugs every day. And then, as you said, that's not something that veterinarians on a daily basis can keep up with. So that's why they rely on us. And why when I was in practice, I relied on dermatologists like you to help with those pesky skin cases that were not the straightforward things. So is, are, there, are there certain things that a pet owner should have at home in case of toxic ingestion? Yeah. So a good question. So one of the things that most of us probably all have in our house. Can you say something, Renee? I asked the better questions. Let me just tell you. <laughs> Because you know why? Because then Renee and I would be talking technical stuff and I people know. that we know in and common. And it goes like okay. right over my head, right? Uh, okay. Over yeah. head. So no, that's why I question. Asked, like the practical, okay. whoa, what do I need? Yeah, so the, the thing to have in the house, um, one, even if you have an automatic dishwasher, and most of us have a liquid dishwashing detergent to wash our pans or something else. So some type of a degreasing liquid dishwashing detergent um, I never really cared about the brand. I found that lately, sometimes the store brands aren't quite as powerful as maybe they once were. And so I'm usually going to recommend something that a name brand like the Don or Paul Mollock or, you know, something like that. That's a good, so that way, if they get a skin exposure, we can get that off of them before they have either one, it either absorbs and again, and becomes more of a full body issue or that it causes local damage to where that's that. And then if for dog owners, I do recommend they have a fresh, unexpired hydrogen peroxide at home. And there's a lot of, there's a, there's a lot of disagreement. Some people really believe in, in having them inducing vomiting with hydrogen peroxide. Some um, veterinarians are very much against it. I definitely respect everyone's opinion on it. But I know that when we're talking about poisoning, Sometimes we're talking about, you know, life or death for some of these cases or just having issues versus not having issues. And time is often of the essence. It's not immediate. We don't typically need to be able to, to make changes within five minutes or decisions in five or 10 minutes. We have some time. But a lot of times we talk to pet owners and they say, I, I tried to call my veterinarian. They're closed for the weekend. They called the emergency clinic. They have a five hour wait for... I'm at the lake or I'm at the cabin and I'm three hours away from the nearest veterinarian who can see me. And so in those instances, if it's necessary and if the animal kind of meets all the criteria to have hydrogen props they've given, we'll recommend it. Uh, one of the things that's really important though is that you should never get a hydrogen props without talking to a veterinarian to give you the amount that they should be given. I've had calls where they gave as much hydrogen peroxide until the dog would vomit and the dog never vomited. And then where, you know, a bottle of hydrogen peroxide later, this dog's going to have a lot of issues because um, there's a safe amount and there's an unsafe amount. And so we make sure that we give them only that safe amount where it's unlikely that they're going to have any issues developing. Well, also, it, sometimes you don't want them to bring up what they've ingested. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. You bring up a great point. So just because they ingested something doesn't mean we want them to vomit it. So because if it's something that can cause, we'll call that corrosive effects. So they'll cause burns and ulcers to develop maybe in the mouth and the esophagus and in the stomach and the intestinal tract. The esophagus is very difficult to treat and it can cause and we don't want things to come up twice. We don't, if it's going to go down once, we don't want it to come back up in your yeah. instances. And sometimes it's not going to be problematic. So think about maybe like brake fluid and motor oil. If those are things that if they vomit that up, they can actually inhale it and cause what's called aspiration, which can cause significant lung 
trauma. And that can be damaging, if not fatal. And so sometimes we just want them to pass that through. But it really depends. So you, you bring up a great point. One of the things that I never want a pet owner to do is to make the assumption that, oh, he, he, he ingested this. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to, I know what to do. I'm going to vomit him and bring it up. Because sometimes they actually cause more harm than in those kind of situations. So I always say never do anything without talking to a veterinarian. And even if it's not us, if it's, you know, your veterinarian, call your veterinarian and get guidance before you start doing things. Because I, it, it's always disheartening when I talk to pet owners, gosh, what they got into isn't problematic, but what you did is really is. And so now you have to go for a veterinarian not because of what you as opposed to what they got into. Are there any toxic elements that can be absorbed like through the skin? Yeah. So um, a really good one right now is, you know, tea tree oil is a big one. You can Dr. Google anything. And so you'll <laughs> read about uh, Dr. Google will recommend tea tree oil for ear mites and hot spot and for uh, flea control and a lot of those types of things. And tea tree oil actually has a really narrow margin of safety in dogs in cats for that matter. And so people will be applying, especially the concentrated form. You might see pet shampoo that has tea tree oil in it, really low concentration, not a problem. But when we put in concentrated tea tree oil, uh, really it gets absorbed through the skin and then that can be extremely problematic and we can see some neurologic things developing. What is tea tree oil? I assume it comes from a- It's tea natural. No, but it's, so is there a specific tree called a tea tree? Like an elm tree? <laughs> you know, that's a great question. I, 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 it's something I haven't thought about. I'm Googling while you all are talking. I'm Googling. Yeah, I can't, but I can't remember if it's actually from a tea tree, from a, like the tea tree or, um, no, if there's a I plant. think there is a tea tree. I, tea I do. Tree. But Janet, well, I drink tea, tea, but I've never heard of it. You know, Renee, what about, I've, I've read about cocoa mulch. Do you, do you see much of that as far as, point? oh, wait, go ahead, Janet. Tea tree oil, also known as, and I'm going to mispronounce it, melaleuca. Oh, melaleuca. Mel melaleuca. Thank you. There you go. It's an and essential that's... oil that comes from steaming leaves of the Australian tea tree. Mm, okay. It's believed to be antibacterial when used topically, used to treat acne, athlete's foot, lice, nail fungus, and insect bites. Unless you're a pet. Unless you're Unless a pet. Unless you're a pet. Right. <laughs> I had no idea, yeah. so sorry, I had to clarify that. Yeah, yeah, and with your pet. Yeah, and then so cocoa mulch, and yes. who can not be- What's cocoa uh, mulch? So it's made from the from the, the whole or the outside of it, the actual cacao or the cocoa, you know, like what we get yeah, yeah, yeah. out oh. we get chocolate. Oh, people wow. mulch with that? Oh, okay. Yeah, and huh. so you certainly can be poisoning just like you would with chocolate poisoning with that. Oh I don't know God. how common it is. We get a few calls on that, but not very often. I don't know that it's a really common mulch that, that people are using yeah. or if it's something that, you know, if you think about it, that's probably going to smell pretty good and be an icing to dogs. But we see some calls with it, but general chocolate is definitely a, a lot more common to see issues with. Hey, did you know that for dogs and cats that could benefit from a prescription diet, Blue Buffalo offers natural veterinary diets formulated by animal nutritionists and veterinarians for certain dietary needs like kidney support, weight management, gastrointestinal support, and my particular favorite, dermatology. They make a food allergic diet that's an alligator based called NP or a hydrolyzed salmon based for dogs and cats called HF. Contact your veterinarian about these prescription Blue Buffalo diets. What's your number one? Like, what do you get the most calls about? Yeah, I heard that's a good question for you guys. What do you think? What do you think is the most common thing? I might think hear right now, I think marijuana of, of people that will own up to it because it's always the roommate. Yeah. Or <laughs> <laughs> I think we that should or, say it was the lover because it's sort of. Oh, <laughs> okay. I, I think marijuana or ibuprofen. What do you think, Janet? I'm thinking it's an over the counter drug like acetaminophen, ibuprofen. Mm -hmm. What? Grapes. Anne said grapes. Yeah. Ate you a whole bag. You, you hit our top 10, our top oh, 10. Well. But our, our number one is chocolate. And it's oh. been number one for 
ever since I've been here, which has been 11 years and probably longer than that, we're in our 20th year of business. So we're not, we're not new to the game. And so I think chocolate's been the number one and it, it, it wins by a landslide uh, this <laughs> year. So we look at them every year. We, we, we go back. And so we look at our 2023 top toxins now. And the second one is grapes and raisins. So, but it doesn't even come close. It's not even a close second. But um, ibuprofen, let's see, ibuprofen was third, and xylitol, xylitol was fourth. Uh, marijuana is definitely in there. I think it's number six uh, this year. And I believe in 2022 or 2021 was the first year marijuana hit our top 10. I think it's just what you said, Alice. They, you know, people are uh, now, now people used to be more hesitant to say, my dog got into this even though we know what they did because their signs were consistent with it. But now I think it's more, obviously there's a lot more states, I think more than half of our states have legalized marijuana in some state or form. And the other one is that it's just so much more socially acceptable. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I spoke at a conference in a state that I won't name and this past weekend in marijuana is illegal in that state and they marijuana was never for their top pin for the state. I bet it's Michigan. It was not Michigan. Uh, but, but it's something that, you know, people are just more like, yeah, yeah, my dog got into this. I had, you know, yeah. THC, and that could include THC gummies or edibles or, you know, a lot of different types of products. It does not include CBD. We categorize that separately. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Well, children are getting into the gummies and into the chocolate and not knowing it's, you know, yeah. least, as they say. Yeah. And so, okay. So, not so good and it tastes good. What's the process? My so my dog has ingested something, and I call your number, and then and what? you're panicked, and, and I'm you're freaking, freaking out. out, and I'm out of my mind because they're having seizures, or they're you know their eyes are well, I don't know, whatever. Oh, yeah. Okay. Well, it's bad, yeah. right? And I'm I'm not I'm okay. a lay person. So, so what, you call the toll free number, right? Go ahead. And then what happens? Yeah. So after that, then the call is answered by one of our uh, credentialed veterinary technicians. And we gather information about what happened. So I can, it can be extremely frustrating for the, for that pet owner, because we know it, you know, like you said, I don't know what to do. I'm panicked, I'm stressed and I'm scared. And we know that, and we want to try and help uh, through that process as quickly as possible, but there's just information that we're going to have to ask. We're going to have to ask about, you know, maybe what's your name or what's your phone number so we can call you back if, you know, if we get disconnected and but information about your pets. And sometimes people will think that that's really unimportant. Why are you asking me what breed of dog I have? And that makes a difference as to what we can do, you know, did we induce vomiting or should we not? Or does that particular breed of dog, are they potentially more sensitive to something else? Or, um, you know, how, how big, how big are they? What's their size? And that's really important because again, as I said, the dose makes the poison. So. Is it going to be problematic based on your pet's weight, even though, you know, ibuprofen, is it one ibuprofen tablet is going to be different for a 50 pound lab than a two pound chihuahua. Right. And so we're going to ask those types of questions and we're going to want to get information about what it is they got into. Um, some of the things that are really helpful is they got into some type of like a rat or a mouse bait, keep the packaging. Keep the packaging or at least take a picture of the packaging. Don't lose that because a green block of bait doesn't mean it's one particular type of ingredient. And there are a lot of different ingredients that are out there in different mouse to rat bait. We're going to gather as much of that information as we can and as much as information as you can get us. And then we're going to, we're going to calculate and we're going to formulate a plan. You know, is this going to be an issue? If it is an issue, what do we expect to see? Now, what do we need to do next? And um, there is a fee. We have an $85 US fee uh, for consultation. Unfortunately, we don't receive any government funding. So we are a standalone independent business that has to pay for our staffing and our technology um, equipment. But um, it's something that then, you know, we gather all that information, decide if it's going to be an issue or not. And we tell you this is what needs to be done. And if we send you on to the veterinarian, then that veterinarian will call us. And then we can talk, they'll talk with our doctor, with our veterinarian, such as myself. And we'll have that doctor to doctor conversation about 
this is what I'm seeing. This is what we can expect to see. These are the specific treatments we need. We can get more technical. Uh, we can get more technical in that aspect of specific medications and specific um, signs. And a lot of times we'll give kind of general information to that pet owner. Dogs by far are the most common calls that we receive. Cats, but followed by cats. But then you name it, you name it the exotic, the, the sugar glider, the hedgehog, the chinchilla, the, the, the goat, the, the, you know, the cow, the horse, the, you know, yeah. we're, we're on um, for anything. You know, getting back to the hydrogen peroxide, two things. Anytime I'm at the drugstore and I see peroxide on sale, I always buy some because it oxidizes out to water yes. yep. once you open it. And secondly, what about the old fashioned Ipecac? Yes. That's not recommended, is it's it? It's not. Syrup of Ipecac, really, one, it's not very effective, but two, it can actually cause them uh, neurologic and cardiovascular, so heart right. and, and neurologic signs and issues. So the only thing that we would recommend at home for a dog, we would never, ever want you to use hydrogen peroxide in a cat. Um, cats are extremely sensitive to hydrogen peroxide. Mm -hmm. We have seen some um, significant damage to the stomach and the intestinal tract that has resulted in death with them. So if you were to ever call us and say, my cat got into something and I gave it hydrogen peroxide, we're immediately sending you into the veterinarian because that can be really fatal. The downside again with Google, Google is full of information that can be great. It's also full of information that can be deadly. And you can Google, how do I induce vomiting in a cat at home? And you will find instructions on how to give hydrogen peroxide to them. Mm. But um, I would never, I, I would never recommend it. So we're really, I just always like to stress that we're talking about dog hydrogen peroxide. But you're absolutely right. So if you give expired hydrogen peroxide, you're not hurting your pet. You're just not doing anything for them because it turns into water with and so we want it to be, if it's going to be yours, it needs to be what we say fresh or at least not expired. And when it, you pour it out, it needs to still bubble a little bit. It needs to have some bubbling action in order for it to be good. The reason why it worked is because it irritates the stomach lining. And so there is that irritation and on that there. When you give too much of it, that's where it causes more significant damage. So can you, do dogs and cats have the same reflex as when a human, you know, when you touch the back of your throat and you throw up? Yeah, you great, great question. Can you vomiting uh, that way? Not something that I would ever recommend doing. And the reason for that is because you can cause permanent damage to the nerves that are actually protecting that airway. And mm -hmm. so we will get calls from people who, you know, again, they're panicked. They're panicked, right. they don't know what to do. Right. And so they'll try to gag their pet. I'm not sure that you would have as much success with a cat with that, but then with dogs, you know, it's something that can be done. But because you can get permanent damage to protecting that airway, the nerves that help open that airway and close it when we're eating, it's something that we would never recommend. Other people ask about what about giving mustard? What about giving um, salt? And any anything that you could that you can think of, it's something we wouldn't recommend. Uh, salt is probably a common one that people will talk about. And salt can make an animal vomit, but it can also be toxic to them. And so salt poisoning is real. And depending on how much of that gets absorbed, if they vomit, or they may not vomit at all, then all of it gets absorbed, then we can have a whole other issue going on. So I really encourage people to, when you're panicked and you don't know what to do, number one, stop. Take a breath, breathe, know that you cannot be helpful to your pet if you are not able to think clearly and seek guidance. Call that veterinarian, call Poison Helpline. There is somebody who can help you 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Um, there's always somebody around. So always seek guidance from a professional before you do something um, on your own. Same thing with your child, right? We have children and I would, <laughs> there's things that I, I, did, I wouldn't do without calling either human poison control or my pediatrician to say, should I work, you know, can I do this? And in, uh, animals are the same way. Somehow I remained as a mother more calm when the boys were hurt than when the pet was hurt because the boys would pick up on you and yeah. I'm not sure the pet would get, you know, the verbiage and all that. You know, animals are, animals are animals. They don't yeah. know. They don't know that things are bad yeah. for them. They just know, you know, they live in the moment, which is why we love 
right? They they live they live in the moment and what what tastes good, what smells good. Hey, this has been left open. I love this new water bowl I was just given. You know, they don't they don't know to stay away from those things. Just like toddlers, they don't you know they're they're living in the moment. So uh, yeah, bullet bowl cleaners you gotta be really careful. With. And antifreeze because like Anne puts in yeah I was just gonna ask here about in the winter and that's bad. Really, yeah. and I imagine you must see seasonal peaks of stuff That's like right. antifreeze yeah, in the winter. winter. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So for you, Doctor Allen, um, you know we could we could talk about seasonal changes for our skin, right? In the summertime and spring, we have allergies, and we have yeah. you know we call that hot spots or more that you know moist dermatitis that forms. The only one like right now, and, yeah. And in veterinary medicine too, like when I was in practice, we had parvo season, we had you know allergy right. season, we had so we see those peaks and, and, and troughs as well with um, toxins and ethylene glycol or antifreeze. So that active ingredient in, in antifreeze is a concern and it causes fatal kidney failure. And there's, um, once it happens, once the damage happens, we can't reverse. We can't, uh, we can't treat it once it's happening. So it's something that we have to catch, be able to catch right away. Uh, in order to keep that kidney failure from, from warming. What about the driveway salt? People are always fixated on, I'm not walking my dog in the winter, especially here in Ohio, because of the salt. Do you see much of a problem with that? Yeah, you can. It depends on the type of salt. There are some that they will say are more pet friendly types of salt. So um, when I think about salt, obviously the first thing that comes to my mind is table salt. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of different types of salt. There's salts that have calcium in it and magnesium in it and potassium in it. So some different types of minerals. And those can cause problems depending on the amount that the animal gets into. If they're ingesting a lot of it where we can have what are called electrolyte abnormalities. So those are things that can potentially need treatment depending on what they get into. If they're walking on the ground, they're walking in it and they get us, you know, some of them stuck in their paw pad, they lick it off. Probably not going to be a big issue. It's when you go to this, to the, you're to the side of the door and there's a whole bucket full of salt yeah. that's just waiting to be scattered and they go in and they take a little more cold back. Then that's usually where we're going to see a bigger issue. Hmm. So are there things in the garden like herbs or plants i know lilies are really bad for cats the whole lily plant but are there things in the garden that they shouldn't eat like you know i know they eat tomatoes off the plant you know because they're there, are there yeah things they shouldn't? yeah so the biggest one that comes to mind is onion so if you plant onions in your garden and in our garden we have it fenced off because yeah. we have a cat that likes to uh, she she likes to eat. She likes to chew on leaves and plants and grasses and things like that. And so um, onions are a big thing. So onions are toxic to both dogs and cats. All parts of the onion. So not just the the bulb of the onion, but even you know that the green uh, part. And so green onions, chives, shallots, you know whatever type of onion you want to talk about. And garlic is in that as well. So garlic's in that category also. And so that's, for me, when somebody is talking about their garden, that's going to be the biggest one that jumps to my mind is that we want to keep dogs and cats away from the onion plant. And cats are even more sensitive than dogs are to onions and garlic. So that's why, that's why we really um, walk out, which is why we fence off that. Because if our dog were to get a couple of nibbles here and there, probably not going to be a big issue. But our cat, you know, when she likes to really kind of uh, sit down and enjoy and, and, and enjoy something for a while can be uh, definitely problematic. You know, with onions and garlic, we can see blood cell changes. So there's a component, there's sulfur in onions and garlic, and that will cause damage to the red blood cells. And then the red blood cells will be off. And so it causes anemia and to occur, which can be certainly fatal to your who would have thunk, right? So yeah, we have a question. We have a question from our live audience of one, which is Anne. <laughs> what about ant traps? Ant traps. Excellent. Yeah, great question. So most of the time, ant traps are used in the household. So we call them residential that you buy, right. Target, Walmart, the grocery store, what have you. Most of the time, you're not going to be problematic. 
they're really low concentration of their active ingredient, regardless of what that active ingredient is. They're really a low concentration. They have a tiny amount of product in them themselves. And so most of the time, they're not going to be an issue. I will say though, if you are in an area that you have a lot of fire ants outside and you're using ants, bait, and granules, Side, especially when people will put a handful on, a, on an ant now, that can be extremely problematic and potentially that rates a dog and cat. So very different. We're talking about inside ant traps, usually not a big deal. We don't want the dog swallowing the whole trap and it can be a foreign body concern, but we're we'll excited about things outside and there are any granules or even the liquid form of this, this ant base that can really be problematic. And we can see our body tremors and seizures. From it. So yeah. are there other things in the house that like we should be put up high or? Um... Yeah. So medication. So we kind of right. talked about it a little bit early on that any medication, any supplements, vitamins, anything that you are taking for your health, we want to keep that up and out of the way. And mm -hmm. I always, you know, we're, we can go to the ex extreme and say, ideal, it should be behind a locked door. Right. But the reality is that we don't, that I don't have a lock mm -hmm. in my house. Right. Um, but if we can keep that up high where an animal isn't getting into it, I, I call them the comic, uh, the um, assassin cat. You know, the cats <laughs> that are in the household with the dogs and they want to knock stuff off of the, <laughs> off of the countertop yep. and hope the dog eats it and gets in trouble or maybe yeah. not so that they can be the only pet in the house. And it goes like this. <laughs> yeah. I never thought of that. Yeah. And <laughs> so, you know, we want to make sure that even though you put it to the back of the, of the, of the countertop, yeah. what if, you know, could that animal still get up there and get, and get to it? So up and out of the way, up in a, you know, up, a, up in a high cabinet would be ideal. And then let's make sure that you keep the pet's medication separate mm -hmm. from your medication girl mm -hmm. so, um my mom if she were to watch this she wouldn't appreciate it but she called me once as, when i was a veterinarian i wasn't it wasn't in toxicology yet but she had given her pets um her medication because she kept them both together by yeah. the that in the morning she took her medicine she gave her, her uh, you know our pet the medicine and and she just she just mistakenly yeah. wasn't thinking and she she gave her um, or in, for her not, it wasn't an issue, but it's common, right? We're, we're all human. We do things. We, our minds are, are constantly going, thinking about other things. We kind of go into uh, auto drive, autopilot, and we do stuff without even thinking if I even did that. So we want to keep our medications separate. Animal medications over here, uh, human medications over there. And then also I always recommend if you are taking medication, take it in a room that is closed off so in that you don't have your pet with you so <coughs> go into Sorry. the bathroom shut the door take your medicine so that when you drop a, a pill or something falls which it will yeah. that there's not a cat or a dog that's there to sweep in and, and yeah. clean that up for you and we get many many calls where that happened where the owner was trying to take their medication or they got their medication on the countertop or the table they walked away to get a glass of water. They came back and the dog had, you know, dog or cat had eaten it. So really be really careful about that. And the um, pill, the weekly pill containers, yeah. those are really dangerous for pets because they knock that down and they get a lot of those things that can be problematic. Make sure you know what medications you're taking and you're using. So write that down because when, when your pet get that bottle, that prescription bottle and choose it open and choose it up and you can't read the label anymore. Let's we'll make sure we know what it is that, that was in there and what the milligram strength is and things like that. So that's a good tip. Thing that's really important. And it sounds like it gosh, you know, do I really have to be that cautious? You do. Yeah. Uh, or you'll you know, you'll call us and you may even be that cautious and accidents will still happen. Well and I'm sure there's lawn care products that are bad too. Yes, there can be. Um, when we think about most of the residential products, most of those, if they're, once they've been applied onto the yard, mm -hmm. if you think about, um, you know, either spraying or the granules distributing them, the animal really isn't going to be able to ingest enough to be problematic for that. 
And so you can certainly have some mild stomach upset that typically actual poisoning is going to happen. We can get concerned with those more if they're getting into the bag itself right. and they're ingesting a large amount. That being said, it depends on the type. It depends on the, the ingredients that are in there. A lot of them will just cause stomach upset. Some of them can actually cause pancreatitis, which is an inflammation of the pancreas, then can be potentially deadly in really severe cases, but they will cause the vomiting and diarrhea and a lot of stomach issues that way. And then depending on if there's iron, you know, if there's iron in those products that it, that depending on the type and the amount that they get into might be problematic as well. Milorganite is a fertilizer that contains sewage sludge. And so it's made out of sewage material, uh, which can have a lot of different ingredients in there. And that one, we can actually see joint pain and muscle pain in animals. Now I live by the, by a, a sound, an ocean, and I'm now at a lake, an inland lake. Are there bad things in those bodies of water? Yeah. So, yeah. So um, lakes for sure. And sometimes you can see it in like pockets of low lying areas around the river and things like that, that actually have just kind of pooling of water, but we have to be concerned about blue green algae and most States, counties, areas do a really good job of uh, looking at, you know, monitoring areas for blue green algae because that's toxic to humans as well. It's a human health risk. What about, you know, I used to get a lot of questions about, um, and be, even though I was a dermatologist, dogs that eat goose poop or rabbit poop or deer poop. More than intestinal parasite issues. So they could potentially get like tapeworms or something like that. But yeah, oh usually God. it's not going to be a big issue, but when you think about, yeah, you know, ducks, geese, deer, you know, things like that, you think going to be an issue other than maybe they can get some type of intestinal parasite. The other thing, um, speaking of at this time of year, seasonal corn cobs, you know, Ooh. people think, oh, give them the rest of the corn cob to chew, but th that doesn't digest. And I know that's yeah. not a poisoning, but still it's. Yeah. Yeah. He asked the corn doesn't it. digest in humans. Yeah, oh, that's true. Corn. Where's the corn? Remember that? Yeah. Corn. yeah, a lot of times those corn cobs end up having to get surgically removed because they don't they don't break down. And they can be there for months. I remember a dachshund that was like 17 years old and it was in kidney failure. And, they, you know, besides that, they couldn't figure out. And here it had this corn cob in them for months at a time. Oh, God. Yeah. Think of what that collects on the way out. They always talk about Tide Pods, or detergent pods for children. I, and I guess it's, and Renee, you could speak to this about why it's a problem in dogs, but I can't imagine sinking your teeth into that. It's like so bitter tasting. Is it just they sink their teeth or they eat it? Yeah. So I think what becomes a big issue is that you're right. It probably doesn't have a good taste to it, but when they bite it, it looks, it, it, it looks kind of for a kid. If you think about it, it probably looks like some candy type thing. And so, and so you bite into it and it, because it's under so much pressure that when you bite it, you get this, you kind of get this quote explosion, you know, all this dust kind of coming out. And so we see those issues, especially in dogs and cats and cats more so than dogs is that they can, you know, they'll, they'll salivate a lot. So they'll drool a lot. They can have some difficulty breathing because they're maybe swelling and they can aspirate some of this. So we talked about earlier that it causes lung, you know, and pretty immediate lung damage because the lungs are saying, this is, this is not right. This could not be in here. So I'm going to send all this stuff to fight it and that causes issues and cells. So we can certainly see a lot of issues with those, with those pods. If my dog eats like a chocolate chip cookie, is that okay? Like, well, how much do they have to eat like a whole tray of brownies? Do you see what... Yeah, chocolate's a good one to talk about because chocolate really, it depends on the type of chocolate. So mm -hmm. there's the concern with chocolate in theobromine, which is a, the ingredient of one of the components of chocolate. And it does contain caffeine as well, but caffeine is in a much smaller amount. Theobromine is similar. It's in the same kind of class mm -hmm. of ingredients as caffeine is. And it depends on what, how much is in that for that particular chocolate. So the, the ones that have more of them. So I usually, I usually look at things that don't taste 
quite as good. You bring up higher the brewing. So baker's chocolate, you know, hunt for pure cacao, cocoa powder. I was just to eat that by itself. It doesn't, it's not very sweet. It doesn't really have a good flavor to me. It's usually added into things. And then we go into semi-sweet, which is in a lot of chocolate chips and a lot of different baking products. And then we get into dark chocolate, which usually tastes better, but still has a higher amount of theobromine than, than milk chocolate and then white chocolate. So it kind of goes into the, to concentrations higher and lower. So if your dog were to get into brownies that were made with, you know, cocoa powder, or maybe that was made with baker's chocolate or something like that. It would need to eat less than if they got into a uh, Hershey Kiss, you know, an oh, M&M yeah. or a Hershey Kiss, something like that with, with milk. Right. So one chocolate chip cookie probably isn't going to be problematic to a dog unless it has a ton of chocolate chips in it and it's a tiny dog. But as so you were talking about a large feed, your golden retriever can probably eat a chocolate chip cookie. But um, if the, the, you know, let's, let's compare, I like to compare an, a Hershey kiss because most of us know what that size is. Yeah. If you look at that, um, it is a milk chocolate and you give that same amount in baker's chocolate or pure cacao, there's going to be uh, differences, concerns for, you know, most dogs can tolerate a Hershey kiss, but a lot of dogs can't tolerate that same amount in a baker's chocolate or something that has a mm-hmm. very so how many calls do you take on average, like a week or is it like all it's 40, you know, it's 24 hours yeah, a we're day. 24, yeah, we're 24 seven. And so we're open. We never close. Well, we're open on all holidays. We're open 24 hours a day. And we're staffed that eight call um, all day and night. And um, I'm not, I'm not sure that I can tell you specifically the number of calls, but we take, uh, you know, well over, um, you know, well over a quarter, quarter of a million calls a year, uh, for sure. Wow. So, you know, we, uh, we take, it's, it's a, a substantial number of calls that we take and we staff it so that we can, you know, our goal is to get calls answered as quickly as possible. There's only times when you may have to, you know, do times you're things that come up where you may have to wait a little bit. And I know that can be challenging and distressing when it's an urgent situation. And fortunately, most of the time we have time that we have some time to do. We want to make sure it's getting done out right, but we, we know it's important to, to get the answers that you need as quickly as possible. And so we try to staff as fast as we can to make sure that that, you know, the, the wait is very minimal. There may be holidays or, or something like that, where for some reason, the moon is just right for an animal to get into more things than what they normally would and things that they you know, come up that are unexpected. And what's the number, please? Yeah, one 213 You can also find us on the internet, petpoisonhelpline.com. And you may see a different phone number on that as well. We have several different main numbers that you can call, but you can also find a list of different things that if you want to look to see, is this topic to my pet or not, you can find that information there. Uh, we also have an Instagram account and a Facebook account that we try to, we try to put things that, if, you know, and not coming up now, but we may say 4th of July is coming up. Watch for these, you know, fireworks. Right things like that, or Christmas and some different things, just to kind of get you thinking as a pet owner to kind of, you know, heighten your awareness a little bit more to maybe uh, prompt you to keep some of those things out of reach as well. Wow, that's great. This has been so informative. Their website is so helpful. It tells you how to make a pet first aid kit. It goes through every room in the house of potential toxins, including outside. It's, it's fabulous. I I complimented Dr. Schmidt on their website. It's so, there's so much knowledge there. This has been really informative. Thank you so much. And we appreciate the work that you do. Well, thank you for the invitation. It's really cool. Thank you. So Janet, ask her our final leading question. So Dr. Schmidt, what is your pet or human peeve? What pisses you off? (laughs) Oh, it annoys you. Um, Clutter. <laughs> With three yeah. kids, three yeah. kids, and you don't three like kids clutter. And, yeah, clutter. I mean, obviously, life is life, and so you don't have to kind of just, you know, 
deal with it at times, but uh, I don't like clutter. I don't like having clutter around. I like I don't like people who uh, in my children included who just leave stuff laying around, you know, not cleaning up after themselves. I like I like things to be more neat and tidy. If you were to look at my desk, you would not say that that's true right now because <laughs> I have some stuff to run around. But uh, but yeah, I like I I don't I don't like I don't like people who just leave job. There you go. See, I Janet? Totally get it. Totally yeah. get it. Thank you so much. This yes, has been incredible. this has been Thank wonderful. You. Thank you. So, Janet, I guess we need to wind it up. I'm I'm putting, as we speak, Pet Poison Control Hotline. Or I am, too. I'm going to follow on Insta and everything. It, it's this on feed really right now. Great. Yes. We Thank will have you. a link um, at the end of the show on the podcast mm-hmm. Facebook page, both with the phone number and all of um, the details of the website and Pretty much what Dr. Schmidt had to say today, which was tons of stuff. Wow, it's a lot. (laughs) So this is Dr. Alice Novotny Jeroman. I'm a Novotny sister and... Janet Novotny King. I'm a Novotny sister. We're from Cleveland, Ohio. We're proud native Clevelanders. Um, Go Buckeyes. Thanks for tuning in today. We hope you learned some valuable information about making decisions about your pet's health. And don't forget to follow us on social media and subscribe on podcasts because we love to have those likes. Thanks so much for listening. That's actually really good. Oh, you good. could both go bye-bye. Bye-bye. You know? Yeah. How okay. about woof woof? <laughs> oh.